So grab your Bible or whatever you use for your Bible as we get ready to go before God and receive his word. Say this out loud. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have, and I do what it tells me to do. I love my Bible. Therefore, I make this as a confession that I will meditate therein both day and night on a chapter in the morning and a chapter in the evening. And because I do, my life is blessed. It is no more a mess. Now, everything I touch, everything I touch turns to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah, glory to God. Amen. Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to study your word and receive another word from you. Uh, Thank you for those that are connected online all over from the north, the south, the east, the west. For those that will listen later, we pray that the revelation knowledge will flow freely and uninterrupted into every heart. And that as a result, we'll be better because of it. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. All that agree with that prayer said, amen. Open with me, if you would, to the book of James, chapter 4, verse 6 through 7, and also verse number 10. I'll be reading this in the New Living Translation. It says, but he gives even more grace to stand against such evil desires. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but favors the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. So we started a series two weeks ago in the light of recent events, and I want to thank Pastor Carol for ministering on love last weekend, Uh, and and, and thank you so much always, sir. I appreciate the anointing on your life to preach and teach the Word of God. Well, we started this series in light of the Elevation series from the new year. Uh, if, If you missed any part of Elevation, please go back and listen. Uh, It is a powerful word from the Lord. God doesn't elevate proud people. And the opposite of pride is humility. So this is a series about humbling ourselves. It's a series about humility. In review, the prophetic message that was given instructs us to humble ourselves like a little child. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 1 through 4, as we looked at it two weeks ago. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? There's the kingdom again. Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, little children, you will by no means reach your next level. You will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of God. Now, uh, already this passage is rich. It's full. It's overflowing. He starts out by talking. uh, The disciples wanted to know You know, how do you get that next level? How do you get the promotion? How do you get to sit at the right seat of the throne of God? Who's the greatest? How did they get there? What can we do right now in order to be advanced in your kingdom? Jesus called a little child, not just a child, but he called a little child last week. uh, I called to the platform Marquise. He's our our little son. Uh, He's the youngest. And, you know, he ran up there and I asked him, how important is he to himself? And he said, two, because I had asked him before, how old are you? You know, in other words, he wasn't cognizant, cognizant of his own importance. To my wife and I, our children are extremely important, as I can imagine the same is with you. But notice Jesus called a little child to use 
as an example to tell us that unless we be converted, literally, unless we reverse our direction and become like a little child, then we won't reach our next level. Man, this is good. So uh, the point is, a child is not thinking nor is cognizant of their own importance. I asked a very key question last week. How important are you to you? How important are you to you? And as you examine that question, as you think on it, meditate on it, what should be revealed are areas where you need to humble yourself or think less in result of and more like a child. Little children have no thought or thoughts about how important they are. Isn't that right? In the grand scheme of things, they're not running around comparing their importance. I'm talking about a little child. Almost, I mean, Marquise is almost at the age of not being a little child where he's, you know, he's got his own thoughts and he wants what is wants and he ends up going in direction as we all as human beings do. We develop the sense of importance. But when you talk about a toddler, a, 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 a very small child, barely walking or just walking, they're not going around thinking about themselves. They're not estimating their importance in comparison to others. They don't have high thoughts or opinions about their own importance. They're not cognitively aware of it. And so it's so important for us to understand that you will not reach your next level unless you reverse your thinking about your own importance and bring yourself into a humble condition. So now listen, this prophetic word is for me just as much as it is for you. And I'm endeavoring to learn as I am instructing you. I'm trying to wrap my mind around how do I humble myself as a husband, you know, I'm the head of the house. I'm the highest. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm at the top. The husband is first and then there's the wife and the children, so forth and so on. But how do I humble myself as a, hum, as, as, as a husband trying to wrap my mind? How do I humble myself as a pastor? I mean, you know, for those that are a part of faith family, I'm over you. I'm in charge. I'm, I'm at the top, as it were, of the organization. I'm trying to wrap my, my mind around how do I humble myself? And I'm learning this with you. So again, in order for you and I to reach our next level, we've got to reverse our thinking about how important we are and bring ourselves into a humble condition. That means we need to know what this looks like. And if we don't reverse our thinking, then someone else will. Or something else will reduce us to a lower position in our eyes or in the eyes of others. The title of this message is called Your Number One Enemy. So I want to talk to you today about your number one enemy. I know for me, my number one enemy is in me. So this is going to be an awesome message. It's deep, and you want to be able to grab a hold of this. So say this out loud. My number one enemy is in me. When I thought about that, uh, and maybe somebody could put it in the comments for me. Um, my number one enemy is in me. I want to teach you that today. I don't want you to just hear it and take it. I want you to see it in the Word of God, okay? And... When I, when I wrote down the title, Your Number One Enemy, I, I also put it down with an apostrophe. Y you, your, you are number one enemy. All right, anyway, go with me if you would to the book of Romans chapter 7 and let's dig into this. My number one enemy is in me. Paul said something powerful in verse 18. For I know... That in me, that is in my flesh. So we're not talking about the spirit man or the soul. He says it's in me, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. 
For to will is present with me, however, to perform what is good, I do not find. So what I want to show you from the word of God today is that your number one enemy is not the devil. And you would think that the devil is public enemy number one, but not in your life. The devil is a defeated foe. Satan has been defeated. All power has been given unto Jesus and we are sent in his authority. We tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all of the power of the enemy. So your number one enemy is not the devil. Well, you say, well, Pastor Stan, doesn't the Bible say in Ephesians 6 that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against four classes of demon spirits? Yes. As a matter of fact, since you want to quote that, let's go and look at it. So turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6 and let's look at verse number 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil not the devil, but the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Four different classes of demon spirits. There is um, certainly a struggle spiritually but it's with a defeated foe. In other words, the fight that we fight is a good fight because we win every time. Amen. But notice it says here that we we that we're to stand in the whole armor of God against the wiles of the devil, his schemes, his tricks. And there is a trick that Satan uses to get us to defeat us because he doesn't have, are you getting this? He doesn't have the power to defeat you. So he has to use you against you. Oh, y'all going to let me preach this today. There is a certain martial art. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe my brother would know. There's a certain martial art that specializes and trains you to use your opponent's strength against him. Um, I think it's jujitsu, but I, I, I didn't get into all that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't study after that, so I don't know. But I do know that, man, and, and in football and in other sports, man, you can pull a guy off of his axis and, and throw him to the ground. And, and you can literally, I mean, if he's lunging at you, coming at you, you can use his strength against him to defeat him. And that's exactly what Satan does because he is a defeated foe. He has to get you to mess you up. He's he, in other words, your number one enemy is not the enemy. Satan, your number one enemy is in you is in me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible tells us, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And I'm saying to you, like Paul, who was pastoring his church uh, in Corinthians, he said what he said so that Satan wouldn't be able to use their strength against them, to be able to take an advantage of them, because he is a defeated foe. But if you are not... Um, if you are ignorant of the tricks, the schemes, and the wiles of the devil, he'll get you off your game by using you. He knows what can trip you up with God. It's the same thing that tripped him up with God. And it's pride. So all his effort is to get you into pride. Again, we're, we're preparing for our next level. There's a next level coming. You, 2021 will be known as a year of elevation for Faith Family Church, for, for, for us as pastors, for all of the ministerial team, for all of the volunteers, every member, even the visitors are going to experience elevation this year. We'll look back and say that was the year that God picked us up and threw us beyond the usual mark. But God talked to us again and again about humility. 
And although this season, this series may only last another week or two at most, we'll come back later on in the year because we need to stay on our game. And what's that? Humbling ourselves like a little child. So the first thing we've got to learn is that the opposite of pride is humility. Satan knows that if he can get you into pride, he doesn't need to snatch you out of the presence of God. Pride, God resists the proud. So think of it, if your enemy, if he doesn't have the power to defeat you, but could get you to lose with God, then all he would have to do is do what got him kicked out of the presence of God. Think about that. God, before Satan became Satan, he was Lucifer. And he was an anointed cherub that covereth. He was one of the highest angels in all of God's creation. The Bible tells us, though, that iniquity was found in him. He made a colossal mistake. He allowed himself to get into pride and it cost him his place with God. In Isaiah chapter 14, this is one of the main passages of scripture that God wants to pour into your heart today. In Isaiah 14, 12, it says this, how are you fallen? How are you demoted from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning. How is it that you are cut down to the ground, to earth? You who weaken the nations. It was because you said in your heart, look up at me for a moment. Now, this is about to tell us how Satan fell. And what I submit to you in this message is that Satan knows that if he can push you into pride, this is a good message. Satan knows that if he can push you into pride, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He, if he could push you into pride, he can keep you from your promotion. He said, how are you fallen? How, how, how is it that you got demoted from heaven, from a high place and have been cut down to the ground? It was because you have said in your heart, say it out loud again. My enemy is in me. My number one enemy. When I get out of the bed in the morning, this is the thing that's trying to mess me up with my wife. This is the thing that's trying to mess me up with my kids. This is the thing that's trying to mess me up on my job. This is the thing that's trying to mess my money up. This is the thing that's trying to mess my, my health up in every area. The enemy wants to push you into pride. It was because Satan said in his heart, watch this, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit in the mound of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the highest of the clouds. He said, I will be like the most high. Now, if you've ever wondered, how is it that one of God's creations, an angel, how is it that he became the devil? It was because of pride. It was because on some day he said these five things. I'm going to I'm going to ascend into heaven. I'm going to exalt my throne above all the other angels of God. I'm going to sit on the mount of everything and everybody else at the sides of the north. He said, I'm going to ascend. I, I, I'm going to ascend to the heights above the clouds. And then watch this. He said, I'm going to be like the most high God. He exalted himself. It was pride. God doesn't elevate the proud. The opposite of pride is humility. Satan was all about I, me, and my. Can I talk to you about this today? He was about I, me, and my. How important are you to you? And one thing that we're going to learn about pride is that it blinds. That means you could be watching me at this moment, not realizing that you're in pride. One person said that the pride of my heart, the pride that's inside of me, deceived me. 
It lied to me. You have a pride problem. That's what it is. You know what your problem is? <laughs> you have a pride problem. And it's so true. Satan's defeated, folk. But if he knows that he can bring certain things into your life that will cause you to enter into pride. To, everything is all about I, me, and my. Watch how this develops. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 said, yet you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. I remember Jesus. He, he was at that moment. Obviously, Jesus was from before the beginning. He was with the father from the beginning. So he was there the day that Satan said, I'm going to do all of this. Jesus said in Luke 10 and 18, he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Can you imagine that? Bow. He said, I saw that. Satan knows what will cost you your promotion. He knows what costs what will cost you abundance. He knows what will cost you growth and, 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 and restoration. He knows what will cost you the blessing and its pride. So all the tricks of the devil are to get you to act in pride. Mind games. He'll come up to you like he did with Eve. And maybe we'll look at this in, next week. But he'll slither up to you and, and say, you know, well, you, you, you should have this. And you're more important than that. And you're going to let him talk to you like that. And you, 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 you deserve this. You deserve that. And he'll whisper in your ear to make you think that you are more important. And your thinking that you're more important will cause you to act on something. And that will cost you. In Mark chapter 4, am I preaching good? In Mark chapter 4, verse 15 and, uh, through 17, Jesus says, And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these likewise are those sown on stony ground. When they hear the word, immediately they receive it, and they have no root in themselves and endure for a time, but then afterward, Satan brings affliction and persecution for the word's sake. And immediately he trips them up, makes them stumble. Now, you're, you should be familiar with Mark 4 because this is the passage that we used to say that Satan's going to bring three things into 2021. He's going to try to rob you from hearing words and messages like this. He's going to bring affliction. He's going to bring persecution. But now, but now think about it. What is he bringing it to do? He can't defeat us. That storm did nothing. It's going to be 70 something degrees today, right? We'll be back to normal and beyond. But what did he intend to do? He wanted to get us to act real ugly with the plumber, with the house warranty people, with the auto repair people with the, you know, the electric company. He wanted us to think, you know, well, I pay my, you know, we, and, and, and he just wanted to bring that to get us to act in pride. When he brings affliction and persecution, it's to get you to act in pride. When he stirs up people to talk about you behind your back and you find out about it, he's doing that so you can act in pride rather than act in humility. I me and mine. Verse 18 says, now these are the, the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Notice that there are also three other things that the enemy tries to use. He tries to, which are in you, cares of this world deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things when he tempts you with cares of this world he's trying to get you to act into pride when he brings about the deceitfulness of riches or tempts you with the lust of other things he's trying to get you over into i me and my we have a perfect example of this in jesus 
The Bible says that Jesus was tempted. And when you, when again, because we're not ignorant of his devices, we know what his tricks and his schemes are. He tries to push you into pride. So is there anybody in scripture where the enemy tried to push him into pride? Well, Nebuchadnezzar was one, but we have our own Lord Jesus, whom Satan tempted. What was he tempting him to do? He's trying to push him into pride. This is another very important passage of scripture. I wish I had the time to go over every part of it. But Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. He returned by Jordan and he was led by the spirit into the wilderness. He was tempted 40 days by the devil. Tempted to do what? He's trying to get Jesus to act in pride. When those days were ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Satan came to Jesus the same way he came to uh, 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 Eve in the garden. If you, he just knows. He comes with this lie, not because he's a defeated foe. He's trying to get Jesus to act in pride. If you are the son of God, make this stone become bread. But Jesus answering, saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by it. He used, he humbled himself under the word of God. Then the devil taking him to a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of this world. There are other kingdoms in this world besides the kingdom of God. In a moment of time, the devil said to him, all this authority I will give to you in the glory for it has been delivered to me and I've, and I can give it to whomever I will. Therefore, if you will worship before me, it will all be yours. He tempted him to act separately from God's instruction. And when you and I act separately from God's instruction, we stumble as a result. God resists us rather than gracing us. Who am I preaching today? Therefore, if you will worship me, it will, this will all be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written. He humbled himself to God. He humbled himself to God's word. Satan will lie to you and tell you that you can't afford to do what God has instructed you to do. Whew, humble yourself. Answer with the word of God. Get behind me, Satan. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem. He set him over the pinnacle of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. He already knows he's the son of God. But again, he's, he's, he's playing this mind game, trying to get Jesus to act in pride. I am the son of God. Poof. Call down fire and do all these things that God didn't instruct them to do. But he humbled himself and he said, It has been said, you are, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And when the devil had ended every temptation, I know I skipped a couple there. He departed from him until another opportune time to tempt him again. So I submit to you, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm about to close in just a few minutes. But I'm going to tell you what's going to happen this week. And I pray to God that you'll start to recognize it when it happens. Satan's already defeated. But everything he brings into your life, the games that he plays with your mind is to get you to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. He's trying to get you to focus on I, me and my. In Philippians chapter two, verse eight, Jesus, who is our example, being found in the appearance of a man, humbled himself. That's what we're trying to teach you how to humble yourself. Jesus had to humble himself. Who do you think you are that you don't need to humble yourself and learn humility? He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, this is the last and, and, and the, another very significant part of this message. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 16, all that is in the world, the lust of, excuse me, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. I remember I was going through a really bad time in my life. I messed some things up very significantly and I went to the church, went, went, went to the church for counseling. And the counselor, in passing, just at the end of one counseling session, he said to me, have you ever done a study on, on, on pride? And man, you know, I kind of swole up. You know, I'm a a minister, a pastor, I taught Bible school. and But at the moment, I'm thinking, no, I don't, I don't think I've ever done uh, a separate study on the subject of pride. Um, 
but why are you asking me about pride? We're supposed to be talking about this money problem or this, these people problems. This, you know, what, what people are doing to me. You know, all of what I'm going through. You know, what people bring it down on me. And you, you're talking about pride. But I remember, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to humble myself to look to God for answers. And I did a study on the subject of pride. And that's when I saw where my failures, which I thought were the result of other people. But it was my pride that messed me up. It was then that I learned that in 1 John 2, 16, when he's saying all that is in this world, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I thought there were three things, but there's not. There's just one thing in this verse. All that's in this world is the pride of life. It's not of the Father. That's not the Father's nature. That's the nature of the devil. And that's what we're going to look at next week. I pray you can come back. It's Satan's nature. All that is in the Think about it. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. It's you wanting something for you. It's you seeing something you want for you. So lust is as it relates to you. Let me say it this way. The sin of pride is at the root of every sin. I'm going to pick up with this next week. The, the sin of pride is at the root of every sin. I, me, and my. That's the root of adultery. That's the root of suicide. That's the root of depression. In 1 Timothy 6 and 10, it says that the love of money is the root of all evil. I know that. It's not money is the root, but it's the love of money. So notice, it's not money that's the root of all evil. The sin of pride is the root of all evil. It's you wanting something. See, money, what can money buy me? It's me wanting something for me, which is what pride is. The Bible is trying to teach us. Satan is trying to push you into pride to keep you from your promotion. Listen, you cannot commit adultery for somebody else. Pride is at the root of adultery. It's you being too important to you. It's you thinking about you and not about your spouse, not about how badly this is going to hurt them. I said suicide. Think about it. You think that, 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 that a person of suicide, maybe it was depression. Maybe it was them. Satan pushed them into an area of pride where all they could think about is them and, 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 and all that has happened to them and that the world would be better without them. But they're not thinking about what effect that's going to have on their children and, 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 and their, their family. And it, it, it's a pushing into pride. And it costs. So now that you know, what should you do? Now that you know, this is the tactics. This is the jujitsu. He's moving you to use your strength against you. What should you do? Humble yourself and learn how to identify pride. Know your enemy. That's a war tactic. And your number one enemy is in you. My number one enemy, say it out loud, my number one enemy is in me. Well, praise God, we are on our way. We're in a good place. God's given us a good word. Before we go, maybe this message really touched you. Maybe you've done some things that you haven't even repented of. You felt under the circumstance that you were entitled to it. You did it because of what somebody else did. And in your pride, you haven't even repented. Could be adultery. Could be fornication. It could be withholding when you should have been giving to God. You, you, in your pride, you thought, I don't need to tithe. I don't need to give. I don't, maybe people have treated you badly. I don't, I'm not going to forgive them. You know, I, they, they treated me bad. And you know, it's pride at the root of unforgiveness. And you've held on to things that people have done to you in your pride. Jesus said, if you don't forgive them, how you, how, what does it look like for your heavenly father having forgiven you? You holding against them what they did. Who am I talking to today? That's pride. 
Say it out loud. My number one enemy is in me. Now, in your spirit, you're right before God. But Satan's played tricks in your mind to get you to think highly of yourself. Learn with me humility. Humble yourself right now. Let's all pray. If you want to give your life to the Lord Jesus, you can do it right now. Or if you want to um, get the sin off of you, unforgiveness and maybe some of the things that you've done, let's, let's, let's pray and repent before God. Say it out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this word today. I come to you right now to give you my life. I humble myself like a little child. Forgive me, Lord, for my sins. Lord Jesus, I pray to you, Father. Jesus died on the cross. Say it out loud. Jesus died on the cross, bearing my sins. But Father, you raised him from the dead. Come into my heart. Save me from my sins. I repent for all my sins. And I accept your offer of forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. I forgive those who've sinned against me. I release it. I let it go. I renounce pride in me. It has no more place. Show me pride when it pops up in my life. In Jesus' name. Amen.